Musk release. I already mentioned his talk in my usual introduction of Professor Sexton, so I will not take more of your time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me, Lenk. It's a huge pleasure to be. Oops, just warn me when I get over that line. <laughs> yeah, so it's a huge pleasure to be here, and it's a wonderful environment. It's just unbelievable to be here. Okay, so um, the one thing I first want to discuss a little bit is um, I don't know precisely what your level is, and I think it's probably very varied, and I've already seen Mario here, which means that <laughs> I don't want to bore him with some stuff, but maybe there's other people here that are less advanced, and I might just have some slides which are just too basic because I was just giving in another lecture, another summer school, and I think people were less advanced there. So, but please, if I'm going too fast or too slow, could you give me some feedback on saying, okay, now this is, I, I think everybody knows it, or this is, I have no idea what you're talking about. Also ask questions during the lecture, that's not a problem at all. Um, I have too many slides, so I won't make it to the end anyway, it doesn't matter where I end. Um, but if, yeah. I don't want to make it to the end, let's put it that way. So it's much better if you would ask me questions during the talk. So this is a group of physicists and mathematicians and machine learnings all mixed together. So I've, I, I'm a physicist from training myself. Um, so I've, I've tried to sort of mix in a little bit of um, sort of physics into the, at, at least as topics that are relevant to physics into this uh, sort of lecture. There's two sets of lectures. Today I'll be talking about degenerative models and a bit about free energies. And then next uh, sort of lecture will be more about uh, symmetries. Okay, so here's the overview of what I would like to talk about. Um, I'll go very quickly about some sort of high level uh, sort of uh, discussion of why you know, generative models are important and how they relate to discriminative models. This is sort of philosophical almost, if you want, with a few equations. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about introduction to graphical models. So who knows what graphical models in this, in this room? Does everybody know? Yeah, mo most people do know about graphical models. Um, mo you know, but there's a whole generation of new students who had no knows nothing about it. It's just only deep learning at this point, right? So I'm just trying to refresh that other things existed once in a time. I'll talk about variational inference and variational EM and how they are related. And then I'll talk about uh, the variation autoencoder, which kind of flows very naturally as a result of that. Um, I'll talk about normalizing flows, which is a sort of, if you want, competing uh, framework to do generative modeling. Um, and then I'll talk about this sort of new work, which is survey flows, which combines these two into one framework, which, which might be the most interesting from a research point of view. So I hope it I make, it, make it at least there. This morning I didn't, but I hope to get at least there. And then there's this topic, which is neural augmentation, which is also more researchy-like, um, and so we'll see if time allows, and I'll conclude. Okay, so at a very high level, um, I'm in front of my own screen, which is not very good practice. Um, so there's one super basic equation in machine learning, which says that there's inductive bias, which is the stuff that you know about the world that you want to put in your model. And that's what we typically, when we say modeling, that's what we do, right? We build models that reflect what we think the world works. And typically these are actually generative models. They try to model the generative process of the data from you know, abstract concepts into sort of things you measure in the sensors. And then there is data and you want to combine these two in different sort of uh, fractions um, to make predictions, right? And the better you are at making predictions, the better it is. But sometimes you need to put a lot of inductive bias because you don't have a lot of data, um, or maybe because you want to have out of domain generalization. Sometimes there's a lot of data and you know basically the data is far better than your, Im your own imagination, like in natural language models like GPT-3, I think is a very good example of this, there's lots of data. Um, the task is very well defined, and the, the you know the, the the generative structure of of language is very complicated, and so it's much easier to turn this into a big gigantic statistical model um, or deep learning model, and you know and, and and show that with lots and lots of data you get amazing results. 
So this side of the spectrum, lots and lots of data and a, and a problem definition which is very clear, right? And the domain in which you want to apply it is, is very well defined. On this, you know, generative models where you don't, where you're putting in a lot of inductive bias, there isn't a lot of data to train the parameters of the model. And maybe more importantly, if you want to train it in one context maybe and you want to move it to another context, so you, you learn to drive into in England and then you go to Indonesia where people drive on the other side of the road, right, or France. And then actually you still need to be able to apply those lessons even though everything is mirrored um, and, the, and the traffic signs look different and et cetera, et cetera. People behave maybe different, et cetera. So out of domain generalization also uses generative models much more uh, sort of extensively I would say. Okay. Uh, yeah. In the spectrum, what falls in between? Then? What falls in between? Yeah. Well, okay. So that I'm tr I'm going to argue the models that you know I've been developing fall in between. The VAE sort of falls in between to some degree. There's typically a knob that you should be able to turn. Um, but yeah, we'll see models that fall in between. Okay. What are discriminative models? A quick recap for you. So, um, so a discriminative model is interestingly, it's machine learning is almost the only place where people are using these types of models or developing these types of models. Nowadays, of course, many other people use neural networks. But, you know, this is the, it's, it's sort of a strange way of doing things inversely, which is you have some, something you apply to your raw data and you map it through some unintelligible mush of sort of parameters that you don't understand very well. And you make predictions about, you know, properties of that data, like what was displayed in this image or what was being said or things like this. Right, so you go from raw data to property, class labels, semantic features, et cetera, et cetera. So we call this discriminative models. And of course, deep learning is the core example of this, right? Um, and it's super, I would say, it's extremely uh, sort of uh, successful at this point. It works very well, again, if the domain is limited, many s examples can be collected. It's about responsible at this point in time for 90% of all progress and investment in AI. Of course, there's still a lot of other things happening at the same time, but Certainly, if you look at companies where they invest, you know, they invest in deep learning at this point. Um, and then you can ask yourself as an academic, you can ask yourself the question, is this the final answer? Is it? And that's a really interesting and deep question, actually, which is, can we just keep going, you know, put on out the sails for the sailboat and keep going, which is keep adding compute, keep adding data, and things will get better and better and better to the point that they are as good as we are. Right? And sort of sometimes you think, no, no, it can be true. And then you see GPT-3 and you think, hmm, maybe this is true, right? So it's not, there's no clear answer to this in my opinion. My, my personal bet is that we need something else. And this has to do with the fact that, you know, with basically the previous discussion that there is this exponential explosion of things that you would have to model. And I think you can see this very beautifully in self-driving cars. And self-driving cars, you know, you can get 90% of it correct by training from lots of data. But then the last 10%, which is, you know, the things you would encounter in a random city, it's just very hard to get enough data because there's too many things. But, you know, it's only a prediction. Maybe in the end they do train a big neural net that just drives fine in a big city. But I think we will need more sophisticated modeling um, still to get to AGI, which is to get super flexible AI. And in some sense, you know, you could argue that the Kirks of this world think, you know, just deep learning, uh, you know, it's a fast bottom-up neural network that will just get you from the raw sensor data on your ears and your eyes through the neural networks in your brain to do unconscious prediction of things. Or whether we still need, you know, what AI started with, which is symbolic AI and logic, which happens in the prefrontal cortex, it's extremely slow and inefficient, um, but yeah, but you know, maybe we need it, maybe we don't need it. To just let show you quickly how amazing humans are and actually how, you know, neural networks can do these kinds of things yet. Um, this is an interesting example. I, I'm not sure if you have ever seen this. I hope you have never seen it, but maybe in the, in the, you have probably seen an image of this like this before. It's an amazing creature called water bear, almost indestructible. You can shoot it into space vacuum space and it will still survive and stuff like that. It's like an amazing creature. Is it tiny? Hmm? Is it the size of this thing? Oh, it's tiny. I know. You can't see it with your naked eye. Um, 
Yeah, it would be funny if that would actually roam. Uh, roam. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so i just show you this picture. Let's imagine you have never seen it before. Um, and I'll show you three other pictures. A neural net would, have, would be in big trouble now, right? It would be very difficult for a neural net to then to, you know, solve this task. Here you probably know uh, it looks so similar. It's probably, you know, a water bear. Here you say, well, you know, that's, that's a mammal clearly sitting in the grass. You know, that's not going to be – I don't even know, know what this is. Maybe it's not even anything at all. But, you know, this is, not a, this is not a water bear. And here you might doubt and you say, well, you know, I, I would guess it's a, it's a water bear. Okay. So how come that we do this task so well, right? And I think most importantly is that we – it's not just this one – bunch of pixels that we look at. We have a lot of background knowledge that we embed this pix this in. So we, we, we recognize legs, you know, we recognize some kind of mouth or whatever that is, but we sort of map it onto knowledge that we already know about, right? So we have laws of physics, causality, laws of biology. I mean, what is a lag for, right? What's the function of a lag? Psychology, not so relevant here. Sociology, etc. So we know all these things about the world. And this, in, you know, this is embedded in that in that knowledge, and so it becomes a lot easier. This argue these things, I would say, argue for generative models. Physics is basically generative models. This is how the world unrolls, right? Causality also has to do with generative models. And here's a sort of a second Turing Award winner, uh, Judea Pearl, with this particular citation. It says this ingredient, causality. Um, should allow computer systems to choreograph a parsimonious and modular representation of their environment, interrogate that representation, distort it through active imagination, and finally answer what if kinds of questions. Right? And the idea is that it's a super powerful uh, property that we have that we can imagine worlds that have never been and will never be. And to give you an example, if I ask you to imagine a blue elephant unicycling on the moon, you probably have no issue picturing that happening, right? It will never happen, and uh, you will never see it happening, yet you can do this. And you can manipulate that, that image. You can say, what if, you know, the, it, it, you know, on the moon he runs into a rock, right? You can sort of see this, this elephant fall forward, right? There's no reason why, you know, that would ever happen or why that's useful to you, but still you can do it. And this has to do with, for instance, modularity. You have modules for elephant, for moon, for unicycling, for actions, like uni unicycling, et cetera. And you can put these together to build this kind of video of the world, right? And you can manipulate it. And you can ask what if kinds of questions and all these kinds of things. So that's, that's where causality and generative model in general play a crucial role. And I think that's the part that we haven't really put very much into our models yet. And I think that's going to you know, give us um, you know, the next generation of uh, sort of AI. Okay, so how does this relate to things we do in sciences more generally? Um, in the sciences, people often call these things forward models or simulators, right? And scientists build amazingly complex simulators or generative models. And that's they encode all of their knowledge in these simulators, right? So here is a simulator of two galaxies colliding. Um, and it just uses a few parameters, which are the laws of physics. Um, and we can fast forward this to see things that w one could never ever see in real time scales. Um, there is, of course, simulators of earthquakes or, you know, or the weather, which is why we actually are able to predict the weather. So these are typically in the form of ordinary or partial differential equations or other types of simulators, maybe probabilistic programs, which are more popular right now, which is sort of a language in which you can sort of code probabilistic sort of simulations. Um, or graphical models, which is the thing, you know, which we used to do 10 years ago, which are of, you know, these kinds of pictures where every node means something meaningful, every relation means something that we understand. So they are highly interpretable structures of how variables influence other variables, often causally. And we can also read of independence relationship. This, you know, this node is independent of, you know, uh, this node or something given that node or something like this, right? So there, there's all of these sort of uh, um, sort of interpretable relationships that go with modeling. Okay. Um, so then, very quickly, um, something about GANs. But in more generally, 
how is this related to unsupervised learning? So generative modeling had to do with all these sort of simulators. Um, in machine learning, we typically do uh, sort of unsupervised learning, generative modeling. And here we like to replace the simulator by some kind of highly parameterized neural network. And I'll talk more about that later. And one of the most successful of these algorithms that can train these generators is a GAN, Generative Adversarial Network. And I, I won't go into the details of the math here. I will do these in flows here. Um, but in what typically you know, they do is you first collect some data sets. So here's a data set except for one image which was generated. You can already start looking which one was actually generated and which one was part of the data. Then you train a model here, a generator, that takes in random noise from some arbitrary distribution and morphs it into something that lies on the manifold of real data, which is in this case, let's say, an image of an eight or in this case, an image of a dog. And then, um, and then there is a discriminator whose task is to take, to take in this image that was generated, which we can call a fake image, and a real image, which is a data point, and they don't have to be the same class. They both fed into the discriminator, and the task of the discriminator is to figure out whether this thing was real or fake. And then if it's really, you know, and, and now there's an arms race between these two. So if this thing is good, if it will detect the differences, then this one has an incentive to become so good that it can sort of fool the discriminator. But then the discriminator has another incentive to actually sort of become so good that it can again distinguish them. And so as this arms race sort of unfolds, um, you know, the, the generator that follows is, ex is very, very good. Um, m you know, better than I would have imagined 10 years ago. Like GPT-3, it's like, okay, so I wouldn't have imagined you can generate images that are as detailed and not look like any dog in the real world. Right, so does anybody know, could anybody predict here which is the generated dog? Which one do you think? This one. This one? Yeah. And why do you think? It's too static. Too static. I think it's pretty amazing, actually, because it is that one, but I wouldn't be able to tell it. Do you think it's too, it's just fa the face? Uh, well, yeah, the other one, the teeth, or the, the pimple, or the cheeks, or the whatever, what comes to it. could have been this one, then, too. Yeah, that's true. I see. It's, it's posing. Interesting. Very interesting. I have looked at, yeah, that's right, yes. Um, still, there is no image that really looks like this in the data set. Um, so the people do look for the closest image, and it's not like it, it, it looks very close to this one. Um, okay, so that's GANs. Uh, you can put some equations around this, but it's, it's, n it's not really a lot more than this story. You need a good, you know, model for generating images. You need a, a, a neural network for discriminating, and then you write down sort of an objective that pits them against each other. Okay, so um, now the other, you know, sort of a class of generative models, uh, which in the sort of science community we call forward models. Um, and here's an example. So I have some latent eight that I don't actually know, but I, I want to know. Um, and I have some observations which are sort of blurry, sort of downscaled versions of this perhaps, right? And so, to go from here to here, we send it through a noisy channel, which we call the decoder, which in this case takes a, you know, a, a sharp image that I don't know to sort of observations. Typically, this is, you know, the, the role of these looks inverted, where you have some abstract set of, uh, you know, properties, and then you send it to the decoder, and you, you, you produce a nice image of an eight. That's also possible. In this case, um, so the decoder goes from the latent thing that you don't know to the ob ob observations why. Um, and then there's an inverse model that looks at this and says, okay, I want to reconstruct this, so a super resolution algorithm. Um, and that we call the encoder because it predicts things that we don't know given things that we do know. Right, so you have sort of these equations, why the observations are a nonlinear function of x plus noise, and then we have an estimate of x, which is some nonlinear function, possibly nonlinear function of the observations y. Um, and for instance, you know, uh, there's models like, uh, uh, what's it called again? Uh, compressed sensing, for instance, are typical examples of this. And you probably, people in the audience, at least the mathematicians probably know this compressed sensing. Okay, so then, um, so the variation autoencoder is in some sense a version of this, or at least there's a way to look at it. 
which is you take your blurry image, you send it through your encoder distribution to get your reconstruction or other properties of this, maybe style or class or as well, and you store it in your latent Z. And then there is a decoder or channel model that takes these properties or you know pixel values, or whatever, and send it through the decoder channel to produce the observations again, right? And you want to sort of minimize you know the difference between these two images by sending it through this sort of bottleneck. In this case, it is not much of a bottleneck, maybe, but you know you have to regularize it then. So there's a forward model, p of pi y given x, which is the decoder, and an inverse model, p of x given y, which is the encoder. And how are these two things related? Well, they're related through you know, the equation that everybody knows and loves, which is um, Bayes' rule, which is the discriminator is a model like probability of class given data, right? You stick in the raw data and you predict properties of it. And here's the generative model, which is probability of class, or probability of data given class, which is you stick in latent variables and classes and you, you get data out. And then there's, of course, the P of data and P and the prior over classes, which you need to do the inversion. And if you, if you parameterize this part of your model, uh, you're basically parameterizing your format or your generative model. If you're parameterizing this part of your model, you're parameterizing a neural net or the discriminative model, right? Okay, so the pros and cons uh, for the white box models, they're data efficient. The model uses expert knowledge like uh, laws of physics, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they're interpretable, every, var every variable means something and they're typically better at generalization because we use the causal structure of the model. In the black box models, they are less biased to human imagination. You basically, the world is very complex and complicated, but um, basically uh, these models, uh, you know, they have billions of parameters possibly, and so you don't have to really put in a model. You can just train everything. They're highly accurate because you model your predictions directly and they're also very fast because you don't need to use Bayes' rule to invert it. Okay, so the state of the field perhaps is we have VAEs, we have flows, and then we have GANs. GANs are the more popular version at this point in time. And the more people work on this um, at this point in time. Flows. Yes, I'll be talking about flows actually, yes. If anybody has any other questions, just raise your hand. Okay, so... Uh, this is probably too elementary for you, so I'll just go over it super fast. Um, the only really point I wanted to make here is that many people nowadays treat machine learning as an optimization problem. And I think that's fundamentally wrong. Um, data is randomly generated from a distribution. Um, okay, so here's a bunch of losses. Typically, you can use you know, MLE, maximum likelihood loss, maximize the probability of the data, or the conditional probability of the data, or some loss function. Right. But the point I want to make is that, um, let's say you generate some data set and you estimate some parameter using some estimation procedure. And now you regenerate the data from the same distribution. So it's an equally valid, uh, you know, equally valid set of data that you could have gotten. And you again estimate the parameters of data. So then the question becomes, these are, of course, going to be different because they're based on different data. And you could just investigate sort of the, which decimal place is going to fluctuate if I keep resampling the data, right? Now, from an op observation, uh, uh, from an uh, sort of, uh, optimization point of view, you know, you just optimize it all the way to, you know, the 32, you know, bits that you have, and then you're done. But it's a statistical problem. And, um, the bits that are fluctuating under resampling your data, um, it doesn't make any sense to nail that parameter more precise than the parameter than the than the digits that are fluctuating. Because after you're starting to nail those things, you're starting to fit to the actual specifics of that particular data set, um, which means that. Um, yeah. So which means that, um, that you're overfitting. And so it's a statistical problem at its core. Um, and I guess maybe I can just skip this, which is the bias variance trade of it. Everybody knows about this, right? Anybody who doesn't know this? All right, just skip this. Okay, graphical models really quick. Most people know about it. In graphical models, you're, you know, you're, you're 
uh, variables mean something. They're related by graphs and the Bayesian network kind of thing. Um, and you can read off the independence relationships from the graph. Of course, they would be consistent with the actual probabilities that you write down, which are all conditional probabilities. Um, but you can read off the uh, sort of conditional independence properties. And this is a really cool algorithm, you know, the baseball algorithm, uh, which you can actually use to read off these probabilities so, um, or these independence relationships. So what you do is there's a bunch of rules of how you can pass a ball through the graph, right? So, for instance, uh, you know, if, the, if you have a structure like this, then the ball passes through. If you have a structure like this where the errors come in, then the ball gets blocked. And so these two are independent of each other marginally because the ball cannot get from here to here, right? Now, for instance, uh, this one, so this one and this one are independent given this one because the ball doesn't go through this one. So if I observe this one, then, then these, these are independent given this one. So this is a very simple you know, graphic way to figure out if two variables are independent of each other, yes or no. Um, okay, and then there's marker random fields, which is another kind of graphical model where the edges are undirected. The baseball algorithm works much easier here because there's no directionality. You could just basically say if any path gets blocked by observations like this, then these variables are independent of these variables given that I've observed these ones. And then the probability distribution can be written as a product over these clique functions. They are positive functions over uh, maximal cliques. And the maximal clique is the largest completely connected subgraph. So you look in a graph and you say, okay, these three are connected. This is a, a, this is a clique, right? And here, here's another clique, which are two that are connected. And um, of course, the, these probabilities can be parameterized and learned from data. And the Hammersley-Clifford theorem basically says that if the probability is larger than zero everywhere for every x, x um, then all conditional independence relationships that are, can be read out from the graph using that sort of bouncing ball algorithm um, are consistent with the probabilities that you would compute under this factorization. So if I would integrate over, you know, if I would want to prove that you know, this is independent of this given this, I would sort of have to instantiate certain variables, integrate out certain variables, and then after the integration, I would see that the factorization happens. Okay, so uh, one of the most popular graphical models, this is latent variable model, um, and it's also very powerful, which is that you put some prior on, on your latent variable z, and then you have some conditional distribution of p of x given z, so that the marginal over x is this sort of sum here, um, over z, and that will give you p of x. Now, p of x can become very complicated because it can be sort of an exponentially large sum because there's an exponentially large instantiation number of instantiations of z, and this sum is exponentially large, so it's an, it's an exponentially large mixture model which can be actually be very powerful. Now, we, we will need this because of the in, the in a VAE, that's the kind of structure that we need. Um, okay, so... In order to do inference in these models, which is compute the probability of z given x, uh, what I need to do is approximate inference. Because again, if I can't sum over an exponential number of states, then um, I will have to do things approximately. And there's two al classes of algorithms where approximate inference um, sort of it can successfully be applied. So the first one is a variational algorithm, which I will focus on in this lecture. And the other class is MCMC algorithms, which is also very interesting. So in variational inference, you basically say, okay, so I have a very complicated distribution P that I, you know, I, I cannot really compute or compute averages over or not even sample from. Um, and I'm going to approximate it by a distribution Q, which is in some tractable family, uh, which lives in this polytope. And then I need to optimize in this space to find this, this Q star, which is closest to P. And that's what we do with variational inference. Now, it's deterministic and it's optimization-based, so that's kind of, we know how to do that, so that's easy. It is biased because however much computation I throw at it, I will never get beyond this, this gap here. There's many local minima. The optimization could end up here, and you, know, you wouldn't be able to get out of it if you don't have enough compute. Um, and, but it is easy to assess whether this thing has converged. Okay, sampling is a different class of algorithms where you would, um, you know, stochastically draw points from the distribution P, 
the samples are unbiased, which is good. So if you if you do it long enough, you'll get you'll get the right you know answer. Uh, but you get because you you have only a finite number of these samples, you get a sampling error. Um, there's uh, the, the local minimum issue appears here as a hard to mix between modes problem, and it's hard to assess convergence on these uh, MCOC samples. Can you say what hard to mix between modes means? Oh yeah. So if you have two, uh, if you have a if you have sort of a two distrib if you have a distribution that looks like this, right? And uh, and these samples work as follows, right? They 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 stay they propose close to where they are, and they do and then they accept or reject. And the accept or reject probability is proportional to the probability. So if I if I sort of if I'm here and then I'm proposing here, right? I'm going to something with this probability to something with this probability. There's a very small chance that I accept it, and then I have to do that, you know, five times in order to get here and you know get accepted again. So the probability of you know with a random walk to bridge this gap is just exponentially small. Right, so you will have to do all sorts of tricks to get from there to there. Typically, you need to know something about that mode. Okay, so um, so some connection to physics, I guess. So what we will do is, in the following, we will be discussing this equation. So this is one of the most fundamental equations I feel in, in machine learning, at least in this generative you know, framework. Uh, it was already very important when we did graphical models. In the VAEs, this is also the core example, the core, the core equation. It, has, um, it is a bound of the, the marginal log likelihood. So P of X is the probability of the data. And then log, we take a log for convenience. And you can show that this is always bigger than this elbow. So this is a, a lower bound on this marginal log likelihood. And this has the... the, the um, the approximation comes from the fact that this Q can, is approximate. It's in some tractable family. So it is the, uh, okay, this expectation is a bit silly. So the expectation should go. And there's also a log missing here. So I should really clean up this image, or to clean up this equation. So th remove this. So this says the expected over Q um, of the generative model, P x given z, P z, which is basically this, but without the marginalization. And then minus the entropy of Q, or plus the entropy of Q, actually. That should be a log here. Right? And you can relate this equation basically to an equation in physics, which says that this part is minus energy, and this part is um, entropy. Um, and you know, energy minus entropy, we all know, is the free energy. So you can sort of think of log P of x as the free energy of the system, in a way. OK, so then a little bit about variational inference. So this is all going to introduce the VAE. Um, so in variational inference, we are interested in sort of comp doing computations over an intractable distribution. Let's say a posterior distribution of z given x in this model that I discussed before, where you have z going to x. Um, and so you're interested in computing, you know, let's say averages or you know, so something with respect to this intractable distribution. So what we're going to do is we're going to minimize the KL of Q with P. So we're going to minimize this sort of, and the K, does people know what the KL is, by the way? Who does not know the KL? Okay. That's P, P. It's not a problem if you don't. Well, I can just write it up. Um, so the KL divergence between Q and Z, and you're going to say, okay, find me the best Q that is close, as close as possible to this P under this KL sort of uh, measure. Um, and if you work it out, that's equivalent to minimizing this thing. Um, and you can easily see it because there's a Q log Q. There's a Q log P and a Q log Q. So that's from the KL. And there's a, and there's a PZ given X, but we can use Bayes' rule to, to make that PX given Z PZ divided by PX. But the PX term is completely constant and drops from this equation. So we can we can just we can simply minimize uh, this equation here, or ma sorry, maximize this equation here instead of minimizing this one. And the picture you have in mind is this is the intractable distribution p, and then there's this, this q thing here, which is free parameters, and we're going to train it 
to be as close as possible to P. It will never really make it, but it will be as close as possible to it, right? And that's sort of you're, you're maximizing this thing over Q here. Sir? Theta, okay. So theta are parameters, right? So, and I will come back to that. So, so this is the generative model, P, and this thing might also depend on its own set of parameters. R so right now, I'm not doing anything, but in the next slide, I will be doing something with those. Um, so the phi's are the parameters of this distribution that we're optimizing. So this is just some general you know, model that I've written down with some set of parameters theta. And, and it's fixed at this particular point, but we're, gonna, we're going to train them as well. Okay, so that's variational inference and it's very related to mean field kind of coming. If we put this Q here, if we make it simple by making it a product distribution over the individual variable Z, then you're basically doing mean field approximations. You can also make it a, a joint Gaussian distribution and it would be another kind of approximation. Okay, so then um, what is cool about this, we can use exactly the same equation, which is this, this free energy thing. That's why it's important to sort of remember this guy here. So we can use ex exactly the same equation, not only to, f to do approximate inference in Q, which is this slide, but also to train up the best generative model P over parameters theta. And uh, this is known as expectation maximization. So you can read about expectation maximization in the statistics literature and you'll find very complicated explanations. But the core is truly simple. And this one slide basically explains all of expectation maximization. Um, so first, let's repeat that we are interested in this log P of X, right? Because X is the observations. We have some model P of X defined over our observations, and we want to maximize that model over parameters theta. Okay, so we want to maximize this over theta. So then we first write down a bound. We're going to say, okay, first we're going to write out what P of X actually is. Well, this is this type of latent variable model that I've been discussing, is this model. Okay, so then once I have this, I can actually bound this term by Jensen's bound to turn it into this. So it's, it's actually you know, this plus this KL here between QZ given X and PZ given X. Now, um, if we leave out this term, which is intractable because we don't know PZ given X, then we, are, then we have this bound. And because the KL is always positive, it is actually always a lower bound, right? If I take this and I add that, then I have this is equal sign. If I leave that out, which is a positive term, then it is a lower bound to this term. And it's not so hard to convince yourself that this is true. You just have to insert these cues and then they drop out. And so I get this, this equation with including this is equal to this and that's not very hard to, to write down. So, but this part is the bound, right? And it's this free energy term. So now the point is that we can just take this one equation and say, in one step, we maximize over Q, or the parameters in Q. So now we're just doing this. We find the best approximation to our posterior PZ given X, right? So that's one step. Now the other step is, given our Q, improve over theta, which is our goal for learning this distribution. So now maximize this thing over the parameters theta in this equation. So we alternate these two. So we go theta phi, theta phi, theta phi, et cetera, on this one single objective, and that's called the EM algorithm. So in the EM algorithm, typically, Q is so flexible that it can actually perfectly match P Z given X. And then in the E step, you, you, you sort of, you write down all your expectations under the true P of Z given X. But this is more general, because here Q doesn't even have to match the true the true uh, PZ given X. And it's also, you can take any steps. So you don't have to completely solve phi. You can do a little bit of phi and then a little bit of theta. It's one objective and you're just going up on that one single objective. Is there any questions about this? Uh, from your representation, what is phi? Is oh, this is a set of parameters. So it's the set of parameters that is in this Q distribution. So this Q is a conditional distribution that um, I've, sort of written down as, a, as some parameterized distribution. Let's say 
uh, a Gaussian distribution with the mean and the variance, and then phi would be the mean and the variance. So you choose. Yes, you choose whatever that distribution. Of course, you would like to have a distribution that is flexible enough to get very close to that posterior distribution. Right? And, then, and then the theta are the parameters for, for the p-distribution. More questions? Is this level okay, or is it going too fast? Or is it too hard or too, too simple? I have no idea. Is it okay? Okay. Just let me know, because I don't know what, you know how advanced you are. Okay, so then the next conceptual step that we need to make is um, amortization, which is actually a very, very interesting concept um, that we also need for the VAE. And what do we mean by that? Well, in this particular way of writing things, this Q could be different. This set of parameters can be different for every X. It doesn't matter. I mean, it can for every new data point X I stick in, I can have a different set of phi. But that's very time consuming because at test time, I will then have to look at my data point. I will then have to do my elbow optimization over my Q uh, for every test point. So it's very slow because now I have some iterative algorithm that needs to sort of do that. And that's an interesting idea that any algorithm that's iterative, you can also unroll it and think of each step in this iteration as sort of an, a neural network layer. So one other way to think about this is to say, well, instead of having this Q separate for every data point, let's have one neural network or one model that is basically conditioned on the input. I stick in the input X, which is the data point, and then I flow through a neural net, and then I get some, the parameters of some distribution Q out of this. But the phi's are now shared between all the data points. I have one set of phi's that I train on a, on a data set, and then I have this discriminative model. And with this discriminative model, I can just very quickly stick in a new X, stick in neural net, and produce my distribution Z given X. Okay, so that's the encoder. And then there's also the decoder model again, uh, which is a prior over Z, and then a distribution P of X given Z going down. But the point here is this amortization. And I hope you sort of understand. I mean, maybe if you've reading, been reading about VAEs, it sort of maybe skipped that that's actually a step because now everybody does it. But before that, basically, you know, this conditioning isn't there. It's basically phi is a phi of, of xn. You just redo it for every new data point. And that's still possible. It's more flexible, but it's also more time consuming. Okay, so then the next step is on, on our way to the VAE, conceptually, is to say, well, every time I write down a conditional distribution in some kind of base net, Let's turn that into a deep neural net. So uh, let's write this conditional distribution as a deep neural net. So typically people used to put very simple distributions in here, like exponential family distributions or something with a very few parameters. So now we're just gonna say, okay, make that a neural net, right? Which basically means that in this very simple graphical model, we now have two neural nets, an encoder neural net and a decoder neural net. Okay, and then in a little bit more detail, um, so here's what a VAE then looks like. So you take some, you let's say, in this case, we have two types of latent variables. One is maybe class labels, and one is, you know, abstract properties, latent variables, Z. And I have some distribution P of Z and distribution P of Y. So in order to generate, I pick from this distribution, which is hopefully simple. I pick from this distribution, which is hopefully simple. And then I push it through my neural net and then I get some, the parameters of some distribution P over X, and then I draw a new, a sort of an instance of P of X given Z and Y, which is then, for instance, an image of some kind, right? So this is how you generate images, and it's the same model as in again. It's just, it's your generative model. It's just trained differently now. Okay, so we, you know, we pick these from simple distributions and we push it through a neural net and then it maps it to, to into a complex space like, of pixels, and then it generates realistic images. Okay, it, but we have seen that training this thing is very difficult because we have to use EM, and then in EM we don't know what the posterior is, and so we have to do variational learning and all these kinds of things. So we also need this encoder model, which takes this job of computing this, doing this posterior inference, this approximate inference for us. And for that, we 
sample from X, the input, and like any discriminative model, we push it through our neural network layers, in this case, predict properties of a Gaussian distribution, a mean and a, and a standard deviation, and then have a distribution Q of Z given X from which we can sample and then perhaps, you know, we can also predict a Y given Z or a Y given Z of X or whatever, right? But, but the point is it goes into the opposite direction. And these two things, we want them to be inverses of each other in, in a base rule, in a, in a base sense, right? So we want this and this, you know, this P of Z given X to be the base inverse of P of Z given X. Um, and the way we're going to enforce it is by this elbow. In fact, for the VAE, you know, you can write the objective in this way. You can, it, it is the same as the elbow. Um, but you can write it as a KL over the joint space of X and Z. On the one hand, you have the data distribution P hat X times the PZ given X. And on the other term, you have the decoder, which is P of Z times P of X given Z. And you can write it out into two terms. The first term is a KL between P hat and P, which basically says we really want the model distribution to be the same as the data distribution, which is what we always want. And then the other one here is saying, well, um, I want the approximate posterior to actually be P of Z given X. I want the approximate posterior to actually be the inverse, the base inverse of my decoder model. And of course, these two make perfect sense, right? So then, um, okay, and we can actually minimize this because it's a tractable thing. Um, and so there's sort of two perspectives on this VE. The one is say, I need this distribution to learn this in, in the sense of an approximate expectation maximization procedure. That's one view of why we need this. The other view could be, well, what maybe we're interested in this thing. Maybe we are interested in you know, doing a classification or something like this. And then this is there to regularize this thing, which is to say, here we can stick in all our prior knowledge and our inductive bias, because this is our generative model. This is our channel that we may know. And if we, this is easy to model. Here's maybe causal relationships, etc. This is what any scientist does. And by making sure that our inverse is close to our generative model, we sort of regularize this to be the inverse of something that we know. And later we will sort of try to expand on that idea even further. But I think that's a really important sort of motivation for this is that, um, you know, here's where we stick our prior knowledge and our inductive biases. And we can sort of transport it here by training sort of on this elbow. Okay, that could also be, a the generative model can also be a simulator. It doesn't have to be a, a neural net. How am I doing with time, by the way? Uh, okay, 40 minutes. Um, okay, so let me just go quickly over this because it's a bit technical and um, uh, you maybe ask questions if you want to hear more. Um, so that I can make it to survey flows as well. So um, there's two really important parts about making the VAE work. And one of them is uh, here. And that has to do with uh, the fact that in order to, so what we've done is we have introduced this Q and um, we made it very complex because we made it a deep neural net. That's good because that means that it has, a, it can actually approximate the true posterior very well. But of course you cannot do any real uh, averages over this thing. So what we, in place where we have said, well, at least we want to be able to sample efficiently from this Q. And of course, if this is a neural net where we just stick in X and we produce Zs in one upward move, then actually we can sample very efficiently from this Q. But by sampling, we introduce noise because now we're gonna, an actual expectation we're gonna replace by a Monte Carlo expectation over samples. The other place where we're gonna introduce noise is by the fact that this is actually a sum over data points. And we don't want for every gradient to, you know, basically sum over all the data points in our data set. We want to pick a mini batch, like in stochastic gradient descent, we wanna pick mini batches. And in order to pick a mini batch, you, that's what we do. So we again have a Monte Carlo sum, which means that we have now introduced noise twice, and I've actually written out the gradient here in a naive way. If you write out the gradient in a naive way, it sort of looks like this, and it turns out that has a hugely high variance. And maybe it's important that 
you cannot really train a neural any any model if you have very very noisy gradients because um, you you don't you know for every sample that you for every gradient you want it sort of it sort of points in some random direction that is sort of almost in the right direction but all over the place and it's just very hard to minimize something efficiently when you have that very noisy gradient so just doing it like this doesn't actually work and so what you need to do is a trick, and that trick is called the reparameterization trick. Um, and in the reparameterization trick, it's very, I think it's very neat. So let's first go over this particular example. In this example, I say, okay, let's, let's say I'm gonna try to compute the gradient with respect to mu of this integral. Now we all know what it is, right? Because this thing, if I work it out, it's mu, and then I compute mu, and so the answer must be one. Okay, now I can do this in two ways. I can say, well, I can first move the, the gradient in here, and then I use this trick, which says that the gradient of a density is uh, the density, so if, it, if I do sort of gradient mu of P of, 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 of um, yeah, I'll say X given mu, right, then that's, that's the same as saying that P for X given mu times the gradient mu of the log. So if you use that trick, right, and then and then sample over over this guy here, so if we replace this with samples, then you get to this equation. So samples are drawn from this from from this distribution, and then this is basically the the gradient of the log of p. Now if you compute the noise, it's huge. So if you if you try to compute your gradient here and minimize something, it's, it's terrible because the noise is all over the place. But if you do the reparameterization trick, which I'll talk to you in a minute, then the, then the variance is zero. There is zero variance in that gradient. Basically, what you will have is the sum over ones, one over s. And basically, there is just one answer, no, no variance at all. So the advantage can be pretty dramatic, actually, with this, to do this trick. And it's very important for learning. What's the trick? Well, the trick is to say, I can write any sort of conditional distribution in another way. I can say, well, I can write it as a deterministic function, where z is a function of its parents, of the parameter theta, and of some random noise, some, some random variable epsilon. And then I will just you know, draw epsilon from, from some standard distribution. So I can rewrite this as this. It's the same thing, basically. Of course, the function g and epsilon, you know, you have to design what this p is and what this g is, but you can do it. But the nice thing is, if you do that reparameterization, then in fact, this thing doesn't depend on theta anymore, and I can pull all the gradients through it. So if I write down the gradient of the, of the bound like this, the gradient of phi, where this was the elbow again. Now, if I reparameterize this q using, you know, drawing an epsilon from some standard normal distribution p, which is this guy here, right? And then making sure that z is now a deterministic function of these things, which is z is now a deterministic function of epsilon and phi, these two things. Then I can write the gradient like this. And now the, and now it's a, you know, the gradient will apply here, because z is a function of phi, and the gradient will apply there, and the gradient will apply there. But if you do that, then the, the noise in that gradient is going to go down a lot. And that's super helpful in general as a trick to learn. Questions? Yeah, I guess that's a bit different. Um, Well, okay, so I guess for stochastic gradient descent, um, also there, I think people try to m minimize it. Um, there is tricks like momentum and you know Adam and all these kinds of things that that try to sort of minimize that as well. But I want to say that that's only the noise that you get because you're mini batch. But here there is an additional source of noise which is coming from sampling from Q. So you sort of it sort of hit twice. The other thing is that um, these types of expressions. I mean, this type of expression, um, if you sample 
you know, something like this times the other terms. Maybe I can, or here maybe. So if I now sample from this guy, and I stick in the numbers here, and I stick in the numbers here, then I sort of multiply two things together. And you know, if you multiply two random variables and you sample them, the noise really, you know, really gets higher. It's, it's really a very dramatic effect. Now, it's true that in, um, in SGD, of course, you also have to battle noise, but you know, also there, the less noise, the better, right? And so, that's, you know, you I, I guess it's always bad to have that noise there, but uh, un unless, you know, you ask questions about generalization, right? So th then, of course, you can ask, well, now let's say you haven't, you have stopped learning, you're sort of at the point where uh, you're overfitting. Now, of course, you, you shouldn't actually learn more. And now the noise can actually be helpful. It can be sort of a regularization effect. Mm -hmm. And that's what people often argue when they say, well, SGD has, uh, helps you with generalization in neural networks. Um, it, it is sort of like sampling from a posterior distribution in that sense. But that's a completely different, I mean, in these VAEs, you don't even get close to the optimal solution if you don't apply all these tricks. You stay very far away from, the, from a good solution. And it might be something specific for the VAE that's possible, though. Um, okay, so then, um, so let's let's muse a little bit more on the elbow. So there's three ways in which you can write the elbow. Um, so the first, and it's, uh, this is a completely trivial statement, but I just want to tell you that two two of these are you often see in the literature. So this one is the sort of free energy version, where there is a, again, there should be a log here, uh, where there is a, a sort of entropy term, and then there is this energy term. Then there is another one uh, where you sort of pull the P into here, the prior, and then you get uh, sort of this term, which you can sort of think of as a reconstruction term, and this term, which tells you how far away is your posterior from your prior. And that's sort of how much complexity does your model have? So how, how different is this posterior from your prior? If it's, if it's equal to the prior, you haven't really been modeling anything here because you're still at the prior. But if it, if it moves away from the prior, then it starts to model things. Um, and this complexity term is also often problematic in VAEs because these cues do not move away from the prior very much. And so first people put a fudge factor there to decrease this and sort of first train here and then maybe scale it back up after the whole thing is trained or leave it at a small value. So, so this term um, sort of tells you how complex your model is, how much Z is actually capturing about the data. Um, so this is also useful for, for compression. If you want to compress your data, um, this is also the term that people often use. And then there's an obvious third way, which is now you put this term alone, so the, you know, e expectation of Q of log PZ. And then these other two are sort of written like this. So the expectation of a Q of log P of X given Z and Z given X. And the reason I write this this way is that that is related to flow models in some way that I will explain now. So I'll now go to flows, normalizing flows, which is a different brand of generative models. But by looking at it this way, you can already get a sense that these two things are actually quite related. So the VAE, the elbow, writes things like this, but that's only because it uses an approximate Q. If the Q were correct, then actually it would be very similar to a stochastic version of, uh, um, of, uh, of a flow. Um, and I'll sort of put these things together in what we call survey flows, where you now have one framework in which flows and, and VAEs are sort of uh, mixed together. Okay, and this term is typically something that looks like the volume correction factor or Jacobian. Okay, so how do normalizing flows work? Um, it's basically, again, a reparameterization trick. So if you say that X is a deterministic invertible function of, of Z is an I or the reverse, Z is a deterministic invertible function of X, right? Then I can write a P of X I can re-express it as a P of Z. That's just using uh, basically this equation. And uh, you know, why can I not just write this? Well, f because it's a density. And if I take uh, you know, a transformation that sort of scales my space to become bigger, 
then you know, for densities, that means that I get this Jacobian, which has to correct for the volume factor. So this is basically the log determinant of J, that's the Jacobian, that, or the log Jacobian, and that's the volume factor. Right? And may, maybe the easiest way is that to say is that the P of X dx needs to be the same as the P of Z dz. And that these, these little sort of volume elements which create the Jacobian. Now I can, I can sequence this, right? I, I don't have to do it just for one transformation. I can do multiple transformations uh, sort of in a row, right? So I say the last one I'll call ZT. That's my data. And I start with some initial distribution Z0, P of Z0, which is you know, what I called PZ before. It's a very simple Gaussian distribution. I'm going to apl iteratively apply invertible maps, um, which in every of these steps, I pick up one of these Jacobians. Uh, and then in the end, the probability of the X is g it can also be re-expressed as, as this sequence of things, right? And of course, these are functions, Z as a function of ZT minus one, they have parameters and I can then learn these parameters as well. So that's a normalizing flow. But the limitation of a normalizing flow is that you need uh, invertible functions, right? And so it's not so easy to, to write down invertible functions. So that's often a bit limited. And also you often want to have compression. So you want to sort of go from many variables to fewer and fewer variables, for instance. And so these invertible flows, they cannot deal with the fact that the dimensionality of the space might change. Um, so I'm going to do a brief excursion to Markov chains. And the reason is that they also there, there is an equation that looks a lot like the equations that I'm writing down I've written down before. In a Markov chain, especially when you write down detailed balance, so you're basically going to say that um, I have, you know, a probability of some point X and I have a probability of a point X prime. And now the size of this ball is how much density is actually at that particular place. And I have a Markov chain which, which moves the probability around, which basically says, well, the probability at this X is going to be shifted by a transition probability of x prime given x. So, so some of this probability is going to be re redistributed. You know, a bit, little bit is going to px prime, you know, a little bit is going to px prime prime, a little bit is going back to itself, etc. Right? So at every step, I, I move around the mass in space. And detailed balance basically says that the, that the total mass here and the total mass need to be the same. So probability of x times the probability of the mass that I'm moving should, should be the same as the probability of x prime times the probability of mass that I'm moving here. So this basically means that the total probability of mass between any two points is in balance. It, it doesn't change. And if you require this for any pair of points, basically the distribution doesn't change anymore. It's an equilibrium. And if it's an equilibrium, then you can show for a Markov chain Monte Carlo procedure that you're sampling from a distribution that you like. Okay, so this is the detailed balance property, which has P of xt times the probability of xt plus 1 given xt should be p of xt plus 1. Time this is the backward path, probability of xt given xt plus 1. Now, if you replace xt and xt plus 1 with x and z, you get this expression, which is, again, very similar to the expression that I showed before, is that the reparameterization expression, right? Probability of x is probability of p of z times this sort of Jacobian term, which is in between. Okay, so now I have three ways basically of writing w this one simple equation, right? Which is, uh, which is sort of a variant again of the bound, right? So here is the bound that I've been writing all, all, all the day. It's the log of Px is larger than the expected value of log Pz plus the expected or under Q of log of this ratio. So this was the third way to write the elbow. Now we have also this term, which is for flows. And if you, re if you look and compare these two, well, okay, so this is an expectation, sure. Right? It's over an expectation over P of Z given X. And, um, and here I have a sort of de log determinant term, and here's a P of X given Z, Z given X. So that's this, sort of, but it, it is something like a volume change term. 
And then for the MCMC condition, it looks like this. It's also very similar to this, and it's, it's sort of in between these two, if you want. I mean, this is the expression you get if actually Q of Z given X is correct. It is the correct posterior distribution. Um, then you would get something like this. Okay, so this is sort of a, the so these things seem to be very related, and so now they can all be merged into one uh, framework, one modeling framework for deep generative models that I've written out here. So how does this work? Um, I'm gonna so I start at I, I, what I need is a data data set. I need some prior P of Z, and I need some invertible functions f. Um, and, up and, up and posterior Q actually. And what I want to compute is the likelihood because that's, or a bound on the likelihood because that's what I want to do gradient descent over. So in for some iterations, what I do, if, if I have a bijective transformation F, then I'm just doing a flow. So I'm just saying Z is F, my F inverse of X and I flow up one, one level and I know that I have to compute this Jacobian term. I have to include this Jacobian term. So I'm basically using using this equation here. Now if Ft is stochastic, then I'm sampling a single sample from this Q of Zt given x, which is sort of the stochastic version of F. And now I compute this contribution to the likelihood term, which is the log of P x given z divided by Q z given x, which is this here. And then in the end, I add up all of these terms, and that's guaranteed to be a bound on the uh, true likelihood, like, like the elbow bound was. But now we have mixed sort of flow steps and we have uh, mixed sort of elbow steps together. Um, some of them deterministic, some of them stochastic. And so now it's all one big framework because this is easy to compute and I can also easily compute gradients and just do backpropagate through the whole thing. So in some sense you can now forget about either VAEs or flows this is one framework. It's all, it's all basically versions of the same thing which are based on equations sort of that look like this, which have a, you know, a, a term under reparameterization of some kind and then some term um, that corrects for volume changes. So my question is, uh, the, the Jacobian F, mm -hmm. what is it in the VAE? Okay, now in a VAE there is no, that. There, the, in the VAE we have Qs. So in a VAE we have uh, this. Yeah, yeah. So that's the flow. Okay. Right. So for flow, you have deterministic. It's kind of nice to have deterministic because the gradients don't pick up a lot of noise, right? Because you don't sample. So that's good about that. Um, what's n what's not good about it is that in fact you have the dimensionality should remain the same all the time, and you have to devise these invertible maps, which is limiting. So in the VAE you have a lot more freedom, but now the problem is you're, you have this sort of noisy gradients that you have to estimate. So both have advantages and disadvantages. But if you write it in this particular form, you see that they all look very similar. And in fact, there is one unified algorithm to compute you know, the, the likelihood by picking up either this term or picking up that term. Um, What a what with more layers? So one is the multiple times that the one is bubbling, the one is bubbling just by having a Q with more layers. A Q with more layers? So the other Q oh yeah, yeah. So uh, instead of having uh, your control is not representative. Yeah, the other Q. it it is the same except for the fact that now Q also has these deterministic. Um, well, okay, I'm saying that, but this is in P, right? So so this is our P model. So the Q is there um, basically to, to sample Z, but, but this, this constitutes our, our P. But you could still argue, you know, why is this different from having a P with multiple layers? Um, and you can certainly view it that way, but now some layers are layers that are deterministic and, and, and invertible, and some other layers, they can change their size, and so they, bec they become uh, injective, or stochastic, or s something, and then, um, and then uh, you you know you you have to sort of uh, use a more standard VAE layer. So it's just a deeper net with either flow layers or VAE layers. 
Well, so this relates to the previous uh, question, I guess. So um, the VAE doesn't necessarily have one layer, but that's but stochastic layer. But this was the way I presented it here, so that I understand the confusion. But a VAE can certainly have like Z1 or Z0 and then Z1 and then Z2, etc. X, where what I've sort of written so far is something like Z0, you know, and then, uh, you know, neural network H1, neural network H2 until X. And now there's these, and these are only stochastic, and these are all deterministic, right? Um, but there's, the VAE is perfectly well defined for having these sort of multiple stochastic layers. Uh, yeah, I should have said that, but um, yeah, and, and the people have worked on that for a long time, actually, in, in the hierarchical models with multiple layers of stochastic. The issue is the more stochasticity makes learning harder. Okay. Um, so then let's generalize this. So, so now that we have this new framework, let's see if we can do more with it. And uh, surprisingly or interestingly, um, there's this additional thing which we call surjection. So we, this is like a, a bijective map where right? every point finds another point in this other space. And the stochastic map was like this, which is you know, from, from one point, you have sort of probabilities of transitioning to other points. Now, we can also have surjective maps. So a surjective map, let's say in the generative direction, is you know, two points mapped to one point, for instance, right? So we, get to, we destroy information. We, we literally con you know, uh, contract the space of possible states. Um, but the problem is that if you do that, that in the backward direction, you know, you have to use a stochastic layer in order to map to all the states in that layer again, right? So we can do it if this direction is a surge action, then in the backward layer we need a probabilistic map. And we can also do our surge action in the other direction, which is from Z to X space, right? We can have from X to Z, we can now contract, which is typical, right? So you go from high dimensional space, you, you may want to contract to lower dimensional space. These can be deterministic maps, by the way, right? So not, not like in a, in a flow where these maps are not deterministic. So you contract, but you contract uh, deterministically. But then again, if you go backward, you need stochastic maps. And it's quite interesting that um, by doing that, you could some of these things can become exact. So, okay, so the bijective map is a flow. So you have an F and an F inverse. And the, and the likelihood term you pick up is the Jacobian and the area you're making is zero. Now for the VAE, which is stochastic, your forward is a distribution, your backward is a distribution. The, pick up, the term you pick up is this difference, so this is a log uh, ratio, and you do make a, a mistake because the mistake is now to do with the fact that you, you have a, a bound and not the actual true distribution. Surge actions, so in one direction you have a deterministic map that sort of contracts, in the backward direction, you now have a, a stochastic distribution. And if you want to compute the, the likelihood contribution, you have to do some work. You have to start off from this term, this term from the VAE, and then you know, take, let's say for this one, take, model it as a Gaussian distribution, and then slowly contract the, the variance to become a delta peak. And then you'll find that terms cancel each other and you get a nice sort of expression. You do make a mistake because you have a bound, but if you have a surjective inference direction, this this one, this one here, um, so it's, it's now inversely related. Again, you do the same procedure, but now the error is actually zero. And you can compute these, and I'll just show you an example. So here's a little example of a surjection, which is something that you may not uh, you, you may not have had in your sort of modeling toolkit if you were doing generative modeling. And you may not have thought about using these kinds of things, right? Um, so now let's say uh, our input space is x, and we can write that as the absolute value plus a sign. And then in z space, we now do a contraction, and we say that z is the absolute value of x. So we lose the sign in that step. So going backward, you know, for a particular value of z, we now need to generate the sign from some distribution that we can model, some Bernoulli distribution. And then once we have the sign, of course, x is the sign times z. Uh, 
right? And so that's our x given z. So you see that the backward direction is now stochastic, and this direction is just a delta peak, so that's uh, deterministic, but a surjection. Now, and then you can compute likelihoods. Um, I mean, I'm, let's not go through all the details, but you'll find that if you plug in all the values, you get a whole bunch of delta peaks, and they cancel each other out nicely. And then what's left over is um, basically, where is it, this term. So that's the only term that's left over in the likelihood calculation is the probability of S given Z, but that's nice because that was exactly the model that we parameterized, and we need to backpropagate through that model uh, to learn it. Okay, so we're sort of getting close to the end. Um, there's a whole bunch of other examples that you can maybe go through the slice uh, of these types of surjections. This is known as slicing, where you go from a larger Z space to a smaller X space, where you sort of sort of a mapping between a part of z-space and x-space, and then you have to be stochastic when you go infer this part. The inverse of that is called inference slicing, and pooling operations where you maximize. So you have a whole bunch of terms here, and then you, 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 you only push forward the, the, uh, the maximum term in here. And if you go back, of course, you just move the maximum value in some position here, and then you generate a bunch of numbers which are smaller than the maximum value that you generated, and you do that stochastically. Okay, these are, you, you see, there's all sort of details. Um, I think we are getting close to, I mean, please do ask, start ask questions. Otherwise, I keep going. I, I have one. Yeah. Question. I was wondering, it's a very narrow question, like what is the main advantage of the variety transmission group with respect to the vanilla autoencoder, where I just write like the feed-forward silicon acid neural net that tries to reproduce exons. Yeah, there um, okay, so the problem there is that um, it's not really a generative model because you don't have uh, a prior P of Z. I guess you could sort oh, of... I was always imagining that once you trained it on your training set, yeah. then you cut it in the middle and then you fit whatever like format yeah. in and what it, what it produces is your generation. Yeah, so you're saying I have some, I have some uh, okay, so encoder Q of Z given X or even a function. Right, and then, um, okay, so I have, uh, okay, I get, uh, okay, I, and then my aggregate posterior is all my data points in Z space, instead of, uh, okay, they, they distribute now in some sense. Okay, okay, so now we need to generate. Uh, now you're saying, okay, now I'm going to fit a model to Z space. Yeah. Okay, now the problem is that this space is, uh, okay, you, you fit a Gaussian. All right, so here's my Gaussian. I mean, it has to be a simple model, otherwise everything you could have done on X space, you're now pushing to Z space. So this has to be a relatively simple model in Z space, right? So then, um, now I'm sampling from this model, and uh, this is a high probability here under my prior, but it, it has not seen any data, the decoder has not seen any data in this regime, and so it will basically generate gibberish. So what you need to do is you need to, the, this distribution, this so-called aggregate posterior in some sense, needs to be close to a distribution that you like, let's say P of Z. And if you make this like a Gaussian, then you want sort of these, these posterior samples to sort of generate, sort of do this. Even for a GAN, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think it will certainly not do it. It's well known that uh, if, if you just train an autoencoder, the distribution in Z space can be very complex. So you haven't gained very much in that sense. I should also say that in even in a variation autoencoder, this is still true to some extent, although a lesser extent. And um, you would really need to put terms, which is like almost like a GAN in Z space, which sort of forces the distribution of P of Z to be close to um, the basically, um, you know, one over N sum N of Q of Z N given X N, right? So this is really what you want, and it's not explicitly in the VAE, uh, but to some degree it is, but not explicitly. And so 
making these two distributions the same, you can again do with some kind of gain in, in z space. Okay, that's and good. That's good. Yeah. That's the typical boundary form. Well, actually, but there is a paper by Bernard Chokov's group, uh, and they and they. I forgot what they call it, but they actually do precisely this. So they replace the KL term uh, with a sort of a GAN term here, and then, yeah. and yeah. So you, oh, you, yeah. And, and just like, just to clarify, because we won't really understand how you train the neural loops, but what if I want if I want to generate a new F hat, how do I do it exactly? Uh, from which model? Uh, well, just the VAE. Oh, from a VAE. Um, well, okay, for VAE, I have trained a P of Z, and I have tra trained a P of X given Z. Both of these are being trained. Yeah. So then I draw I Z draw according to P of Z, and I draw X according to P of X given Z. Okay, um, okay so I'll, uh, questions, more questions? Otherwise, I'll just spend a few more words on this idea. Um, very few words, because it's almost time. So there's another direction in which you can extend VAEs. And um, this has to do with the fact that the encoder, so this is a typical picture for a VAE, right? So you have an encoder, you go to Z space, you have a prior, and then there's a decoder X prime, and you want to minimize the difference between X prime and X using some loss. But you really want the encoder to know about the channel. So wh what if you know this very well? So it's a known channel. Let's say uh, MRI reconstruction or, or astro astronomy data. You know what this thing is because that's your measurement process. So can we use, can we make Q be aware of the channel that is being, that, it, that it's going to encode for? And then, so here's sort of a, Here's a VAE with at least multiple stochastic variables that was asked before. So here's multiple stochastic variables. So we go from X to Z1 to Z2, all the way to ZT. Um, so that's the last sort of latent layer in, in Z. And then there is a decoder which goes from ZT back to X. But what if in each layer we can sort of generate X? And using our channel, our known channel, so we know P of X given Z. So that I what if we know this channel? Then we can, from this Z, we can reconstruct X we can compare that x with the true x and gather some statistics of that error and feed that back into the neural network that constructs the next z. So that idea we have explored um, in astronomy where you have this, this type of models where you go from models of the sky that you don't know, you have Fourier measurements, actually you have very sparsely subsampled Fourier measurements, and then you need to go back to that part. And typically people use things like compressed sensing, to do that, but if you do compressed sensing, then you don't amortize. If you do compressed sensing, then you don't learn from many problems that look similar. Right? So you just do it every time you do this map again. Um, but why wouldn't we actually say, well, what we can generate lots and lots of these problems and we can learn patterns to sort of do maybe a rough reconstruction and then sort of clean it up using a neural net. And so we've been doing this for MRI, you, you can do this for error correction decoding where the channel is, is known typically. So you send your data over a noisy channel and then you do some kind of inverse model to do clean up the, the, the errors. Um, so I, in, in light of time, I will just skip over this part. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe this one quickly. So, so the idea of the model is to say, take any classical iterative optimization algorithm like compressed sensing and interpret this as an RNN, right? You add some memory states, and then you train a neural network to correct the iterative engineering solution. So here's the engineering solution which just tries to reconstruct the state. But then um, I have many of these problems and I can sort of look at the errors that, is it make, that it's making on a data set, and I add a neural network to all of this, including some memory states, and I'm gonna train this whole network up to do a better job at reconstruction. And the neural network's job is just to correct the engineer's solution, so the classical update. It will just have a much lighter job because it won't have to do the whole job. It will just have to say, just detect, whoops, the engineering solution is a bit wrong. You have to steer a little bit in the other direction. 
And you can backpropagate through this whole scheme, basically thinking of this as a big neural network that you can backpropagate through. So we did that, and here's, for instance, a nonlinear Kelman filter. And so, th so the best GNN looks still pretty crappy. The best Kelman filter looks better in this case. And then sort of this combined structure, which you know, uses uh, you know, both the classical engineering solution as well as the neural net to correct it is actually very good. Okay, we also did it for an MRI, fast MRI reconstruction. We actually won this particular fast MRI challenge. And we did it for error correction decoding. I'll just skip all this and then conclude. Um, so to conclude, um, MRTized inference basically is the process of learning to do inference, right? And it's based on variational inference, but then uh, you do it, you know, you train a model to do it from by looking at multiple data cases. So variational autoencoders employ this variational inference and also some variance reduction, gradient, uh, some variance reduction in the gradients. Um, now flows is a different type of model and they train directly on the likelihood, but you need invertible maps. And these survey flows that I talked about, they, they unify flows and VAEs into one single framework. Um, so the last section that I went over very quickly has to do with the fact that encoders can actually be made much more powerful by giving them access to all the information, the prior knowledge that you have about the generative process, right? Because again, in your generative process, there's all this prior induct inductive bias and this prior information that you have. And by giving the encoder access to that information in a smart way, you can build better encoders again. Um, and this neural augmentation idea is to build hybrids between classical iter iterative algorithms like compressed sensing or other algorithms and neural networks that and the only, th only job that the neural network is is to figure out whether the classical algorithm is doing a good job. If it does, don't touch it. If it makes mistakes, correct it a little bit. And because you only have to model corrections, it generalizes a lot better out of domain because changes, small def you know, deformations generalize a lot better than the whole signal and also um, um, yeah, it's much easier to model a small correction because it's much closer to a linear problem than uh, if you have to model the entire signal. Okay, uh, I'll stop there. Oh, you're giving a P of uh, a, a P that's given, basically. Basically, basically some like toy model, some like toy model on which one should actually yeah. analyze. Like, how many sensors do I need to get a given precision and things like that? Uh, yeah, people evaluate on the data, um, but you could, I guess, try to define some measure between densities and then see how close these the, the learned density is to the actual true density. I don't think it makes a lot of sense to look at parameters because the, pr the parameterization is completely no. different. So you have to look at some function space. Um, but no, I don't think people do that very much. Uh, they, they look at log likelihoods of the data that are being generated or even at the bound, how, how, how good the bound is. Or how, how pretty your pictures are. That's yeah. what a lot of people look. And that's, of course, very suboptimal. But I guess for s you know the, the, the pictures are very pretty, right? And it's just pretty amazing that those are generated faces. But um, uh, and, and for some applications, that is all you need because that's, that's your application. But uh, yeah, it, it's harder to actually compute the likelihood, likelihood of a very complicated model. But people, right. but people have ways to do it anyways. But, um, but yeah, it's a good idea. Why not? Just have I'm like theoretically interested in how the performance depends on the number of samples. Like other than just like trying to run it on a given yeah. data set, then stuff like that could be yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's not very, it's not such a very good idea. No, I think it's a very good idea, actually. So you know P, you know Q, maybe in that case, too. And you can just see how close the approximate Q and the approximate P are to the true P and Q. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but Q is the approximation. Now, P is also because you learned P, too. So you both learn Q and P. Yeah.